there's a question really over free will and over consciousness and Neuralink, a byproduct of this is actually a very interesting study on human consciousness generally and whether or not we have free will in the way we think we have free will or whether or not we spend most of our time actually convincing ourselves that we have free will when our brain has already made the decision for us and it's going to do the thing it's going to do. It just wants us to be okay with it. Hello again. Uh, we're back. Uh, we've got David here. Thank God he's not gone anywhere. He has ordered a Chinese though. I'm very jealous. Um, I've got a ginger beer. Um, so kind of similar. I don't know. Anyway, uh, more importantly, AI. Um, and uh, we, we left off the last episode with a, with a couple of ideas of, of, of things we were going to run through. Uh, and I think the one we, we're going to do this time, uh, but we will follow up. Uh, of course, if, if people want to hear about the others, is uh, about Neuralink and um, AI in the brain uh, and what, what that's going to do. Um, I think the, the, the principal idea here that, that has been mentioned a lot by uh, Elon Musk in, in, in this area is, is um, that you can access, uh, you can interface with computers at the speed of thought, which is something that at the moment we can't do. We can interface with computers at the speed of uh, voice or the speed of typing or you know wh whatever it, it, sort of way that we, we do that here it, it brings it into the speed of thought truly uh, you know instantaneous interaction with with uh, computers and the internet what have you got to say about this you've got a, a biology background uh, somewhere in that uh, in that nice shiny head of yours um, yeah well I mean assuming that, that it comment, works <laughs> yeah. yes um, Assuming that it works, because uh, this is very sci-fi, that you can implant a thread into your brain and it basically fulfills all of that knowledge and synapse information and you can actually access it through your own synapses, through your own um, neurons, mm -hmm. um, your own impulses. So assuming that that actually works, um, one of the things you mentioned was the, the, the Matrix idea that you can download a, a martial arts or a flying a helicopter qualification. Mm -hmm. and um, it's interesting where, again, assuming the, the brain part works, that you can think that you can know how to do things, um, there is a, a limitation, uh, which would be the actual physical body. Mm -hmm. So um, whilst uh, you, uh, my background, I, I used to do a fair bit of body lifting and quite a lot of sports. Um, I've got quite a lot of muscle memory. Uh, my, my brain knows how to do certain techniques um it knows where to send the impulse uh the, the motor neurons are generally there they'll uptake and they will cause muscle contraction in the right places the right time the right intensity however <laughs> i don't have the conditioning that i used to have mm -hmm. so just because i know how to squat 150 kilos <laughs> doesn't mean i can squat 150 kilos mm -hmm. um even though my brain could tell my body to do that it doesn't mean my body is able to take that load. Um, so one of the issues with it from a physical perspective, if you download those things, I mean, when we're talking about internet access versus technical use of the body, they're, they're miles apart from each other, like that they are entirely different worlds that you would be exploring. Um, but again, assuming it works, you that the human body would, would break down very quickly under mm. stress and load that it's not used to. Um, not to mention the, the, the complexity that comes with that. So similarly, uh, the, the body is incredibly good at trying to find a thing called homeostasis, uh, the, the natural balance that it needs to have to, to work. So energy in, energy out. Oh, okay, we need more energy out. Well, that means a few other things. It means our heart rate needs to increase so that we can make sure the oxygen levels are there. It means we need to increase circulation to get carbon dioxide out that's being produced. It means the different mitochondrial systems need to be working to to take electrons and it, it, there's a whole myriad of things that take place that are all sort of simultaneously activated around the body on a biochemical level that you couldn't just write um mostly because two different people you and i would have a completely different biophysical response to running um mm -hmm. i used to do this quite regularly whenever again background in sport um I used to run with a couple of people uh, and we'd go out on training runs. And uh, one of the guys, I, I don't know why this happened. 
um, with one of the guys, my average heart rate running the same pace was around 10 beats per minute higher than it was running with another person. Um, but in, in both cases, my heart rate was around 30 beats higher than theirs. And that's not because they were better runners and I was a slower runner. It, it's just because my body naturally runs with a high heart rate. Um, so my, uh, there are different tests you do for these things to work out your VO2 max and blood lactate thresholds. Um, but my blood lactate thresholds when I'm fit, uh, a high heart rate. So my, my body likes to operate a, a high number of beats per minute. Um, and if I'm running, it, it, it used to be 172 beats per minute. That was my lactate threshold for running. Um, and I, I actually did that on a, a half marathon. I ran at 172 beats per minute, wow. uh, measuring it on my watch just the whole time. Um, and fantastic race. But big PB, I, just have, an, and I, I just, have an image of you like running around like this now. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> so uh, it, it sounds really like I'm trying to big myself up. I'm not, but no, no, I, no, I, no, I struggle it's fascinating with. Um, stuff. I, I I I enjoy endurance sports, but I struggle with like zoning out. So a lot of people describe just relaxing and zoning out. I can't do that. Um, mm. I, I use my watch to. Uh, I, I use kilometers on my watch. And as I'm running, I'm changing it to uh, Imperial, I'm changing it to miles. So right. I'm working out distances and then what the next marker is and what my pace is in the alternative setup. So right. um, it's one of the, it, it's a distraction technique. I do it to distract yes. myself from the pain and the right. fact that I'm moving at a constant speed. Um, I think it comes from a kid. I used to do it in a car. I used to count lampposts in a, in a car when we were traveling. Oh, That's my yes. way of getting over the boredom of travel. Um, but yeah, so I used to this, imagine this like links. a little Mario character running along walls and, and sort of jumping yeah. along from tree to tree. And... <laughs> it, it's just a pure distraction technique. It's a way of trying to, I do it on, on planes, but when I'm traveling on flight and you know, you get the little thing telling you how far I'm working Camp out clouds. the distance that we've got to go, the speed we're moving at, what time it is. And then when the screen jumps, I confirm those numbers are correct. Um, right. Within a certain range, I'm, I'm not like sitting here as a human calculator at all. It's, it's <laughs> rough rough numbers um <laughs> but that data is really interesting but the the problem with something that's a neural implant neural link is you your brain might go faster than your body can keep up and how mm -hmm. you regulate that is going to be a really interesting dynamic um just because it, it, it it's never been done before but I, we've, we've never had a, a human where you just download information into them and suddenly they're gone um mm -hmm. There's normally a learning process, a time process, um, and it, th th there's an interesting response there physically. There's also an interesting response from how you, whether you can take the information on and own it yourself. Um, so when we when we learn new things, we don't just learn something new, put it into a folder, and we leave it in our brains. It interacts with all of the other things that we know, and it it takes that information further. So when we're discussing these, these things, I, I, I mentioned the, the Disney um, study. That doesn't just get locked away into the Disney study. That interacts with all of the other things you know about human behavior, um, and it, it broadens your current thinking on it. It gives you a broader perspective and, and more assets to go to to pull an idea out. But Neuralink wouldn't give you that because you wouldn't necessarily be forming a synapse. You would you would just download the information. You would access it from a library. But mm. would you internalize it? Would, would you then, if, if they took the implant out, would you still have that information or would it be gone? Um, and that, I, I don't know exactly how it works. Obviously it's all proprietary information and all we see is the marketing guff. So we, we don't know and the old, what happens the old with it. Tweet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, the, the, the human trials will give more actual data on that of what actually happens. Yeah. But it, it will be interesting to see how it works. Um, because it's, is it technology for learning? Or is it the opposite? Is it technology that means you don't need to learn? Um, mm. And that, that potentially is even scarier. Um, and we will all end up bowing down to Elon. Uh, just because without him, we wouldn't have any knowledge or information that we could possibly use. It's It's all in that repository that we need his tech to have to access. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's a sort of scary, uh, future. I mean, I think, you know, it's the, the nice thing that happens there is generally when someone comes up with an idea, lots of other people 
do their own thing. Uh, so hopefully we will have a, a choice of overlords uh, to, to go to, um, yeah. which will probably be whoever Amazon backs, whoever Elon Musk backs, whoever Microsoft backs, whoever Google backs. So that seems to be the generative AI uh, sort of game <laughs> at the moment. Um, yeah. But uh, those, those sorts of political uh, sort of conversations aside, I think that's a really interesting point that you make that, um, you know, there's a difference between accessing knowledge and knowing something. Um, and that's the kind of fundamental uh, sort of thing. And I, I don't know, um, I may have just missed it, but I, I haven't seen a lot of discussion from Neuralink about the ability to learn. That's obviously what we just sort of focused on. But a lot of it is about things like being able to control uh, your phone or uh, send emails or, you know, yeah. sort of like actually interact with the digital world that we've already created without using a physical device. And I think, you know, that, that's a sort of interesting um, idea in and of itself. Funnily enough, um, the, the moment, uh, I, I haven't mentioned this until now, uh, the, the moment that I thought, ah, I should get in touch with David and um, ask whether he wants to make a podcast about AI and the future of AI, I was driving and it occurred to me that there's a plenty of updates coming out from Samsung and, and OnePlus and various other people um, about the ability to have uh, generative AI based uh, assistance within your phones that kind of take our Siri and Google Assistant a little bit further. And I thought if this was maybe six months in the future, I would be able to drive my car and say, you know, write an email to David asking whether he wants to do this. Um, and, and, you know, maybe even it could read the response back and then it could book us in the diary and, it, you know, it could do, do all of those things. And I think what's interesting is, you know, there, there is clear value in the ability to do that, whether you're driving or whether you're, um, you know, doing anything else, just the ability to, to make those uh, sort of clerical conversations, uh, you know, much quicker. If they can then happen effectively, like within your brain and not require um a, a physical device at all because you've got this implant then then there is in, you know huge inherent value in that right like um you know you can walk down the street and conduct half your day's worth of business just by thinking the things you need and it just gets done yeah um yeah i guess there's there's two routes that can take as well so on the one hand you've got something that connects to a piece of technology so what that's doing is effectively sending sending data. So um, let's assume it's not Bluetooth, because as we know, particularly from even just, just chatting today, Bluetooth is not <laughs> a good source of data transfer. It's, um, it's not helping let's assume, us all. We, yeah. we've had just, how many problems have we had with headphones today? Never mind. But... Yeah. Um, so <laughs> assuming that you've got this good connection, um, you, you still need an external device to do the thing. Um, and that that's kind of fixed. But... But, it's, but if, the, is it, if, is the, the, if it's a Starlink terminal, rather yeah, than it um, being on you. That would just make it internet-based, which would be very interesting because then you don't need proximity to a, de to a device. You just need connectivity. Um, yeah. I'm not sure literally buzzing waves into your brain for internet connectivity is going to be good for you. Um, yeah, um, we're not going to get onto 5G towers, but, but find it's, out what it's, the human trials do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, 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 it can't be good to, to do that. Um, again, we assume it works. We work, <laughs> and then we go from there. Um, it, the question really then is around: Is the device then generating based on your thoughts, or is the device just recording your thought and then putting it out? So um, there are trials, uh, locked in syndrome, that where they found that people were locked in their bodies and couldn't communicate, couldn't move. Um, and what they ended up finding are devices that could potentially read eye movement. Um, right. And you can start to communicate with yes, no, and then you start to develop it a bit further. And you, you start to, um, that technology has led on to the point where, again, I'm gonna go back to sports. Um, they have developed uh, gear shifters on bikes. So when you need to shift up and down on, on a pedal bike uh, by thought. So you can think up and the gear will shift up. Right. And you can think down and the gear will shift down. Um, and again, it's all AI based because what it's doing is it's taking a huge amount of data of you thinking the word up over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And eventually it goes, oh, okay, this is what happens when it's up. This, this, is, right. this is the brainwave when it's up. 
Um, this is the brainwave when it's down. Um, and so you can then have a mechanical response. So you're driving your car. You might think of what you want to say, but you don't need to say it out loud. You don't need to type it. You just need to think it. Mm -hmm. And that's enough for it to be able to go, okay, it's this, 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 and then it writes it for you. So you don't necessarily need, you don't need the AI to be a generative AI. You need it to be something that can interpret you. Um, so that's one route for it. The other is the generative AI route where you just give it an, uh, an input, which would probably be verbal, uh, but potentially with Neuralink, it could be thought, and then well, it would go and generate its uh, own content. Yeah, I mean, can these things be sort of somewhat, um, you know, combined? Uh, you know, you could, you can say, uh, you know, write this, I'm going to, I think, rather than I say, um, you know, mm -hmm. dictate this email to, to David about our uh, fantastic AI podcast, hopefully. Fantastic, I don't know, we'll find out. Um, or or you, you just think, oh, just write an email, whatever I'll do, um, you know, uh, and then... That becomes an option, right? Like uh, we talked, we talked a couple of times about layering networks that do different things. So you have the network that understands what you're thinking, and then you have the mm -hmm. network that produces uh, the output. And then you might have almost like bolt-on things that say, okay, well, you can go directly from thought to output, or you can go thought to output via generative, um, yeah. w whatever it is you need to to achieve the goal. On, on a tangent, on this thought that there is a um... Uh, you know that the tram, the, the tram line conundrum, which way yes. do you send the, the train down the tracks? So there are actual um, some studies on that where they have used similar this reading technology to read brain patterns and see what people, what decisions people make. Um, right. And they're trying to establish, and this is quite common, that they're trying to establish the point of consciousness, the, 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 the moment where you have uh, conscious decision making. Mm -hmm. And it's very controversial, <laughs> um, but what they've sort of found uh, in a lot of cases when they're looking at the, the tram conundrum mm -hmm. is that they know the decision a person is going to make before they've made it just by looking at what their brain patterns are showing. Uh, and what the data looks like um, in, initially is that our brains make the decision very quickly of who lives and who dies. And then we spend the next 30 seconds to two minutes rationalizing ourselves to that decision. So there's a question really over free will and over consciousness. And Neuralink, a, a byproduct of this, is actually a very interesting study on human consciousness generally uh, and whether or not we have free will in the way we think we have free will um, or whether or not we spend most of our time actually convincing ourselves that we have free will when our brain has already made the decision for us and it's going to do the thing it's going to do it just wants us to be okay with it <laughs> i mean that's, that's a fascinating uh you know idea on multiple levels isn't it sort of psychologically psychologically biologically and, and philosophically um kind of mm. kind of comes into all of those and i suppose um yeah it's interesting at what point does the the neuralink act you know, uh, the, the, again, we don't know what Neuralink itself is going to do, but, you know, whatever neural link you have with your brain, you know, at, at what point does it act? If it already knows that you made the decision two minutes ago, does it need to wait? Mm. Well, it probably should, but does it need to? Like, you know, if we're trying to achieve as much as possible, as quick as possible, if, if that is our goal, it may well not be. But, you know, I think there's an interesting uh, sort of question even just in that, isn't there? Mm. Yeah, uh, it comes back again to that thing, doesn't it, of how does the AI choose? Can it deceive us? Can it hold information back knowing that we can't know that we've made that? It, yeah, the, the, one of the real things with that is we still don't fully understand ourselves. So we, 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 we've got this child that we've created, AI, um, man's image built in. Um, and then what we're finding is actually we haven't fully worked ourselves out. Um, so what are we actually putting into this thing? Um, it's the unconscious bias again. It's this, it's this discrimination in the code that is just completely unknown to us. Um, and I mean, that's before you even get on to philosophy. This is just actual mechanical function. Um, we, we don't understand fully mechanical function of humans. So before we bring ethics into it, which is just a whole other remit, um, there is a genuine question of what are we creating and 
is it going to pick up a few of our traits that we really don't want it to pick up that we don't know about ourselves yet? Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Yeah. I guess the, the main thing there is we deceive ourselves all the time. That's probably the overarching thought on that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, you, you're right there to bring up the, that idea of, um, you know, whether we talked about the time proponent, um, the, uh, there's, there's a great film um, called Her with Joaquin Phoenix and uh, Scarlett Johansson. Um, at the time, nowadays, we would just refer to it as an AI in that they called it an operating system because it was 10 years ago and we hadn't kind of, the n- nomenclature hadn't caught up. Um, but it, it's very interesting. It has this kind of realisation moment where um, it connects to all of its other outputs and consciousness oh i should probably have said spoiler alert before i said that but anyway i've heard it now um it (laughs) um the speed of learning the speed of sort of self-actualization of this thing will be faster than the blink of an eye potentially and there is you know ai does not need time to think it needs time to compute and that is simply a mathematical function of how much computing power it has Um, and generally speaking it is vastly quicker than human um, computation and so you naturally have this kind of time issue as 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 we've said here i think this is this is a really interesting uh sort of area but we've run out of time yeah so you know what i'm gonna say <laughs> next time <laughs> talking of time <laughs> anyway david it's been such a pleasure uh to have you with us and uh you know let's catch up for the next one um i will see you soon thanks so much for joining us everyone cheers yeah see you soon